Well, good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 31st meeting of 2017. Can I extend a particular welcome to George Adam, who is um, the latest new member of the Justice Committee, although he's no stranger as George has appeared before as a substitute um, at committee meeting and as such has already made his general declaration of interest. We have uh, apologies from Ben McPherson and I'm very pleased to welcome Stuart Stevenson back to the committee who is attending as a substitute this morning. Agenda item one is the decision on taking item five, which is consideration of our forward work programme in private. Are we all agreed? Agreed, agreed, thank you for that. Agenda item two is our evidence session on the civil litigation expenses and group proceedings Scotland bill. I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a spiced paper. Um, the committee will be taking evidence on two bills today so I'm afraid time is tight. Nonetheless, I very much welcome our witnesses for the first evidence session, which is Sheriff Principal James Taylor, author of the independent report that preceded this bill, and Elaine Samuel, honorary fellow, the University of Edinburgh, who supported Sheriff Principal Taylor's review group. Thank you both very much for attending today. We now move straight to questions, starting with Liam Kerr. I will up front just declare an interest in that I'm a practising solicitor and a member of the Law Society of England and Wales and the Law Society of Scotland. Uh, I'd just like to start, the uh, Scottish Government has stated that the primary objective of the bill is to address access to justice. Uh, so first of all, how far do you think that the recommendations you made uh, in the report went towards tackling the issue of access to justice? There are two main elements which are for consideration today, uh, which in my submission to you improve access to justice. The first is the facility to make damages-based agreements available to solicitors as opposed to the present fashion, which is for solicitors to form their own claims management company wear two hats and offer damages-based agreements through their hat, second hat. And the other provision is in relation to qualified one-way cost shifting. Now, insofar as damages-based agreements are concerned, I would be surprised if there was a material increase in cases um, being either brought to the court or um, complaints being made to the CRU. And the reason I say that is because we don't need to predict what damages-based agreements will do to the legal landscape in Scotland. They are here, they are alive, and they are kicking. In, in order to make sure that I hadn't fallen too far behind current affairs in my four and a half years of fallow. I did make inquiry of one firm of solicitors which has its own affiliated claims management company just to ascertain the volumes which they are doing. In the last three years, they have signed up 17,600 new damages based agreements. The five year figure is 23,800. And so you will have seen, well I have seen your, the transcripts of your earlier evidential hearings and have seen the increase in uh, uh, registrations with CRU and, and, and so on. And that will almost certainly be the explanation for that. So DBAs are out there and the benefit of them is being enjoyed by the public just now. What I should say is, in, in that same three-year period, 14,000 cases were settled. And that's because damages-based agreements do much, much more than give access to the courts. What they do is give access to negotiation. 
Thank you. I, we'll come back to a few of those matters, I think. Um, just briefly, is there a danger, in your view, that when we talk about access to justice, there is a danger of conflating access to justice with access to the courts, which is a different concept? Well, ultimately, the ultimate arbiter of justice is the court. But isn't it the, the case that we talk in general terms about access to justice when actually what we're meaning is access to the court, not to the right result? If, if, if we equate justice with the result that people seek, which might be a myriad different things. Access uh, to justice is to enable members of the public to know what their legal rights are and to be able to exercise their legal rights. That may require recourse to the courts. More often than not, it does not require recourse to the courts, as most disputes are resolved by way of uh, negotiation. But if you haven't, uh, if a member of the public is not properly advised as to how to go about the negotiating process, or perhaps worse, doesn't even know of their legal right, then that is a denial of justice. I mean, there, in terms of access to justice, if the legislation is, is flawed and um, some of the provisions are disadvantaging, in actual fact, the, um, the pursuer, then isn't Liam Kerr's question quite valid? You've had certainly access to court, but at the end of the day, then justice wasn't seen to be done. Well, if, if the legislation is flawed, then one has to put the legislation right. I'm not sure what point you're seeking to make. Well, uh, probably as we continue our lines of questioning, there will be certain provisions which perhaps you recommended that aren't in the bill, which at the very least would have been an improvement, perhaps, on the, the legislation. And therefore, by that definition access to justice wasn't achieved the way it, it possibly could have been. Well, I would always be happy for any of my recommendations to be implemented. Okay. Liam Kerr. Thank you. Uh, the Justice Committee has heard previously uh, that uh, a great deal of your report was based on DWP data, which showed that between 2008 and 2011, the claims registered in Scotland rose by 7% compared to 23% in England and Wales. Now, uh, and, and uh, I think the report concludes from this that there's a, an issue with access to justice. Uh, the same data shows that between 2011 and 2016, the number of compensation claims in Scotland increased by just over 16%, and in England and Wales, it appears to have decreased by 4.5%. Does this data affect or change your view of the recommendations you made in 2013? And... Uh, Given that data, are those conclusions and those recommendations on the lack of access to justice still valid in your view? It, it doesn't change my conclusions at all. I, I, I was aware of, of the figures. And what I sought to explain earlier, perhaps rather inelegantly, was that um, one has seen an increase in the number of claims. But that is almost certainly because damages-based agreements have in the past five years become a very common way of funding a party who has, is seeking to um, exercise its legal rights. So that the, was it 16% was the figure you gave? That, that's probably, I mean, I can't say because I haven't done an analysis, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if that came about because of the popularity of da damages-based agreements as evidenced by the figures which I gave from one firm. 17,600 claims in three years is a lot of damages-based agreements to enter into. Thank you. Uh, Maurice Corey. Good morning, Chair of Principal. Um, what advantages do you see in the damages-based agreements which justify overturning the traditional prohibition on their use by lawyers? <clears throat> what yeah, it would be legitimate to say 
If damages-based agreements are as popular as I have just indicated they are, why do we need all this? Well, the reason why we need all this is because at the present moment, they are completely unregulated. They are being offered by claims management companies, and as we know, claims management companies are at the present unregulated. Uh, my report makes a recommendation that damages-based agreements should be permitted to be entered into only by regulated bodies, and I would like to see something like that in the bill. Um, the lack of regulation has two major impacts. Firstly, the percentage which the solicitor or claims management company, it's one and the same, can take is um, unlimited. And the present rate, I understand, can be anywhere between 15 and 20% of all damages, past loss and future loss. I do know of one firm which uses a taper, which is what I recommend should be deployed. Um, when it falls down to 2.5% um, at, at the upper levels. And the other mischief which requires to be addressed, and I'm pleased to say this bill does address it, is that um, there is no clarity at the present moment on what no win, no fee actually means. It, 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 different um, offerers of DBAs use different definitions of what no win, no fee means. For example, um, who is going to pay for the medical reports? Who is going to pay for the court dues? Who is going to pay for um, the expert who will inevitably be required? And what I wanted was a level playing field where the solicitor had to pick up all of these costs, save only for any after the event insurance premium. That means that a member of the public can go to two or three providers and get directly comparable quotes because the last thing I would like to see is um, a go compare for claims management companies. Thank you. If we can just probe a little bit further into these damage-based agreements, Rona. Yes, uh, good morning. Um, yes, you mentioned future loss just briefly there. I wonder if you could um, explain the reasoning behind your recommendation not to predict damages from future loss uh, from inclusion in the success fee calculation in most cases. And do you think that lack of protection for compensation for future loss will leave the pursuers worse off um, if they pursue un the action under a damages-based agreement? Well, at the present moment, the damages which are being deducted, uh, or, or rather the, the success fee which is being deducted from future loss um, is between 15 to 25 per cent. Um, and indeed, I, I heard yesterday in one, one firm is charging 33 and a third per cent. And the public, notwithstanding what might appear, at least appears to me, uh, to be rather generous terms to solicitors um, are still entering into those agreements. And they enter into those agreements because they are simple, they understand them, and they know precisely what the outcome is going to be. I included future loss in the calculation of the success fee because to do otherwise provides an inbuilt um, incentive to the solicitor to delay the proceedings. The longer you wait to get to your decision, the greater the past loss will be. The smaller the future loss will be. We don't need incentives for delay. Further, when cases 
proceed to court. It is usually the tricky cases which are involved. And it is very often the future loss which is the sticking point and which prevents a settlement occurring. And it is at that point that the solicitor and the, the, the lawyer, um, because counsel are used, usually involved in, in, if it's in court at, at this level, as that's when they start to earn their corn. And therefore, I think they are entitled to be rewarded for that. Now, the vast majority of claims settle And they usually settle on a lump sum because it's a broad brush approach which is taken to the negotiation. And there is no definition of past loss and future loss. And if a case settles at the door of the court, you can bet your bottom dollar that there is no consideration of past and future loss. It is just the lump sum which the insurer is pre prepared to pay and the pursuer is prepared to accept to get rid of the claim. And one firm of solicitors when I was going around during my consultation period told me of the problem if there are multiple pursuers where you have a family perhaps um, injured in a road accident and the, the insurer of the car at fault or the driver of the car at fault simply says, oh, Here's a large sum, divvy it up between yourselves. Now, as the solicitors told me, it's hard enough to divvy that up between the individual members of the family. It's even harder, if, or would be even harder, if we had to start working out not just what each member was entitled to, but what the future and past loss was. So that is looking at it from the point of view of the solicitor. Few judges, if any, would claim that their awards for future loss are accurate to 2.5%. They're not. And furthermore, few care plans are implemented to the letter, and it is the care plan upon which the future loss is uh, predicated. The care plan is, ends up not being followed for a whole raft of reasons, social reasons, the family circumstances change, they have to move house, and sometimes one has medical improvements which make life much simpler for the particular handicap which is being rewarded in the future. So the, the two and a half percent is not going to make a material difference to the manner in which a pursuer is cared for um, post-accident. And one ends up with a balance it's a loss of 2.5%, but it provides an access to justice. 97.5% of something is better than 100% of nothing. And the evidence which we have is where I started. Damages-based agreements are popular with the public, even although they might end up paying 20, 25% of their future loss to their solicitor. Now, I know that the position in England and Wales is different. And Lord Justice Jackson, in his report, recommended that future loss should not um, be included in the success fee. But Lord Justice Jackson had second thoughts on that, very much had second thoughts on that. And in one of the lectures which he gave post his uh, publication of his report, he said, 
the following. Ring, ring fencing damages in respect of future loss was out of deference to the vociferous submissions of the personal injuries bar, uh, associ uh, personal injuries bar association, the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers, and others. Thus, it wasn't as a result of the application of principle, but he had the pursuers, solicitors, lobby, wanting future loss excluded. They changed their mind and subsequently wrote to him and sent to him what he described to me as forceful submissions um, that a deduction should be made. Um, I met with Lord Justice Jackson. What I, he and I said is, remains in confidence, but it would be a surprise to me if there, wouldn't, there would have been the same regime in England and Wales had it not been for the attempts by Apple and Paiba to persuade Lord Justice Jackson that uh, future loss should be excluded. He has explicitly said, I deferred to them. Th thank you for that full answer. Can I just clarify very briefly with you, if you can, um, the second part of my question, you don't think pursuers will be worse off um, if they pursue action under... No, they will be... Un under what I recommend, they will be a lot better off. Right. Thank you. Because they will not be suffering 20, 25 percent deductions. Mm -hmm. They will be suffering 2.5 percent deductions. Uh, could I just clarify that, Sheriff Principal? Is it um, just for awards over 500,000 that that would apply? And anything under that, mm, given that it may not happen very often, but perhaps it does, wouldn't be protected in that way? No, 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 no. The, the, mm -hmm. My... My proposal was in the first 100,000, the deduction was 20%. Um, in, in between 100 and 400,000, it was 10%. And uh, above 500,000, it was 2.5%. All right. I think we may look at some of the regulations the government are proposing because I don't think that's on the face of the bill. No, that, and rightly so. Um, I, I think that is properly placed in secondary legislation. Can I, can I just, um, yes, just another question, maybe Ms. Samuel would want to uh, contribute. It's about the cost, who should bear the cost of the independent actuary? Um, your review recommends that the pursuer solicitor should pay for the actuary, and um, do you think they should be able to claim this cost as a judi judicial expense when the case, does, case is won? And if so, why? Um, it is not the it is not for the cost of the pursuer. It is not a cost sh which should be charged to the pursuer. It is a cost which should be charged, paid for by the solicitor. Whether it then f becomes a legitimate um, part of a judicial account, um, I really don't know. It's some years since I've become involved in the principles of what's recoverable and what is not recoverable. So I, I'm afraid I can't help you there. But can I, can I say this in relation to the actuary and, and, its, and its genesis? Um, I, I, was, I went about and spoke to a considerable number of um, both pursuers and defenders firms. And one pursuer firm told me that very often there was great pressure brought to bear upon a pursuer to accept a lump sum when a periodical payment would be far more advantageous. And the pressure comes from family members. They, they see the opportunity for a, a large pot of money. And it has to be said that some of the pursuers also see the attraction in having a large pot of money available to them. And it was out of that discussion, the solicitors told me that in those circumstances, they send the client to an actuary. And they, they want the actuary to give <clears throat> independent advice. And hopefully it would be that it, 
the, the, the pursuer should accept a periodical payment. But it also had the advantage of protecting the pursuer from subsequent criticism. So this idea um, wasn't dreamt up of going to a faculty, uh, going to an actuary, um, wasn't dreamt up by me. It came from the profession. And um, something said in one of the earlier sessions, I think by Mr. Stevenson, when he said, but I could add up a few sums and call myself an actuary. And uh, I have to confess, at the time of drafting this report, I thought an actuary was a protected term. It's not. And it will therefore have to be reflected in the bill. A definition will have to be put in that an actuary will require to be a chartered actuary or a member of the Institute, um, the Faculty and Institute of, of uh, Actuaries. Thank you. Ms. Samu, do you have a view on actuaries? No. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> Liam Kerr, supplementary. Uh, May, the, uh, going back to Rowan Mackay's question about future loss, if I may, uh, it has been suggested to this committee that not protecting future loss could lead to an uh, overall award inflation uh, as courts and negotiators ensure that the pursuer gets the full amount uh, to which they have been adjudged to be entitled. Uh, how do you respond to that? I think there is absolutely zero chance of there being damages inflation as a consequence of these proposals. And the reason I say that is that the judiciary um, doesn't go about with its head in the sand. I'm pleased to say that who are the Beatles is a bit of the past. The judiciary knows that the litigations coming before them are being funded by damages-based agreements. Uh, there's a case back in 2011, the case of Powell, where they said that uh, claims management companies performed a useful function and damages-based agreements were, 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 were a good thing. So they know that a percentage of the damages is presently going to solicitors and we have not had any inflation of claims to date. You see, I don't think damages-based agreements is going to result in a significant rise in claims. We've seen that rise because there has been this popularity in DBAs over the past half dozen years or so. Okay, thank you. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener. Um, there is a definition of an actuary, by the way. It's someone who found accountancy too exciting. <laughs> but, um, uh, but that probably won't do for the purposes required. Um, let me turn to uh, the bill at Section 8, the restriction on pursuers' liability for expenses <coughs> and personal injury claim. Um, and I've raised previously, and I'll, I'll just lay out a modest scenario, that uh, a guy in his Rolls Royce steps out of his car and is run down and severely injured by a cyclist. The cyclist is somebody who's uh, at or has completed paying off his mortgage but has a limited income, so he's asset rich and income poor, so therefore may well be worth pursuing uh, for uh, a damages claim. But, but clearly, in this case, the pursuer is fundamentally likely to be the more wealthy of them. Should, in those circumstances, the pursuer uh, have the option of knowing that it will always be the defender who's having to pick up the legal costs of the pursuer? Because as currently drafted, um, Section 2 really doesn't address this, uh, subsection 2 of 8 doesn't address this, the assumption being that the defender is uh, a big insurance company and the pursuer is uh, the wee person. But there are cases, surely, where that will not actually be the case. The answer, Mr. Stevenson, is that if the defender is a man of straw, the pursuer will not be raising proceedings because there is no point in obtaining a court order, a court award, which one then cannot enforce. Uh, do forgive me though, I'm, I'm positing that the defender, while perhaps of modest income, in the modern world where the purchase of a house 30 years ago 
might have been quite affordable for that person, and is now perhaps in Edinburgh uh, worth something of the order of 250, 300,000. They, they, they are a bit removed from being a man of straw and may well be worth uh, pursuing, but uh, the effects on that person are disproportionate to the benefit that there's some, somebody who is an extremely wealthy person who might be doing the pursuing uh, would, would, would gain. And I, I just wonder whether the bill uh, should be adapted to constrain the availability of the qualified uh, uh, one-way cost shifting uh, more than it currently does. The, the, the difficulty in constraining it, as you suggest, is that then removes the certainty which providing the pursuer behaves himself mm, mm. Um, provides. And the, the danger at the, well, the problem at the present moment is that although rarely do um, successful defenders in personal injury cases recover their expenses, the solicitor advising the pursuer has got to act responsibly and say, I cannot give you a guarantee that you will not be faced with a large uh, adverse award of expenses which will probably bankrupt you. And in those circumstances, the pursuer, not surprisingly, backs off. Now, if I saw an example, which I think was given by faculty, to restrict the circumstances in which qualified one-way cost shifting would apply to those parties who can be found liable to make an interim award of damages. I can't those who are insured, those who have a public body, and there's a third element which uh, escapes me just now. The difficulty with that is that you could end up with um, parties not bothering to insure themselves when they ought to be insuring themselves. You could end up with parties taking on a much higher excess in order to pay a much lower premium and therefore effectively mm -hmm. making themselves self-insured. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and you could find parties who th have policies and therefore quacks would apply but have breached the terms of their policy with their insurers, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the obligation to, for fidelity, for example. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence, one-way cost shifting is not available in circumstances in which it should be available. And the example you posit, sir, is one which um, I cannot say is impossible, but it is de minimis. And what we can do is look to England and Wales to find out what has happened there because in England and Wales, the statutory, the rules of court rather, are the same as what is proposed here. And we have heard of no difficulties in England and Wales with qualified one-way cost shifting being operated as it is proposed it be operated here. And we have spent recently, uh, the lady to my right has spent a lot of time trying to find out what problems there might be in England and Wales as a consequence. And multiple Google searches have not come up with any answers. And surprisingly, when I read the evidence from the insurance lobby given to you back in September, I didn't see any um, flags being waved, red flags being waved at that time. That's helpful, thank you, Camilla. Okay, Mary. Uh, thank you, convener. I really just had uh, a few questions. Uh, first of all, in relation to the tests in the bill that relate to the loss of Quox uh, protection. Um, because in the bill, obviously, there are three situations laid out where Quox would be lost, and that's fraudulent representation, amongst others. Um, and we've 
had a split in the, the evidence we've received where pursuers think that the tests are too strict and then defenders think that they don't go far enough and they won't prevent any spurious claims. So it was really to just get your thoughts on that and in particular um, the test lays out in the bill in relation to fraud and what your views are on that and if you think that the bill Im implements what you recommended in your report. I don't think the bill implements what I recommend in, in my report. Um, if we take clause 8.4 uh, and A, that is, uh, makes a fraudulent representation in connection with the proceedings, um, my pre preference would be for the wording to be has acted fraudulently in connection with the proceedings. Um, fraudulent representation involves word of mouth. Fraud can take, can take place through actions. The other suggestion which was made to you um, that if one stayed with fraudulent representation, one should at least define it is frankly nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, the law of Scotland has known what fraud is for many years it was decided back in the 19th century that fraud is a machination or contrivance to deceive by words or acts. That came from Bell's Principles. And the suggestion that one could enumerate the circumstances in which fraud would be said to have taken place is just a non-starter. Um, I had to look out some really old legal textbooks, but the 11th edition of Glogan Henderson said, it is impossible to enumerate the various words or acts which the law will regard as fraudulent. So um, I've dealt there with just, not just the wording, but also the nonsense which you've heard uh, from others. Um, the second, um, uh, so, so therefore, I'm, I'm not in line with the pursuers' lobby for 84A, but I am in line with them in their criticism of 84B, because I don't think that goes high enough. Um, it, Wednesbury unreasonableness is what I recommended, and uh, I think the formula which uh, Mr. Durolo uh, suggested to you. Um, came very close to being what I would choose to have there. I tweaked his formula ever so slightly, and I would suggest as an alternative, it should read, if in the opinion of the court, the pursuer's decision to raise proceedings or their subsequent conduct is so manifestly unreasonable that it would be just and equitable to make an award of expenses against the pursuer. Um, so I would raise the bar there. I think C is okay, that's dealing with an abusive process. There is another set of circumstances which my report recommended should merit uh, qualified one-way cost shifting not applying, uh, and that is in the event that a case is summarily dismissed, to use an English expression, is struck out. And much has been said here, and rightly so, about the potential for there being frivolous claims brought. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, in, in, in my opinion, there are two reasons why frivolous claims will not be brought. One is you're going to have to persuade a solicitor to pick up the fees, and, or his time, the fees, and also the outlays without little prospect of recovery. And secondly, if the action raised is of no merit, the, there is a facility in the court uh, introduced about five years ago following the civil court's review, whereby a defender can say to the court, this action has no merit, strike it out. And in those circumstances, the benefit of qualified one-way cost shifting uh, is lost and should be lost. And one of 
so I would have another element put in there of D. And uh, finally, in, in the session you had with the insurance lobby, it was said by one of their number uh, that even although the pursuer didn't beat a tender, qualified one-way cost shifting continued to apply. Well, not in my world it doesn't, and not in the um, report which I've made. So I, I accept entirely the bill team's rationale that dealing with tenders and their nuances should be in secondary legislation because you don't want to start fiddling with the common law in a, 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 an act of parliament. But I, I think I, I'm persuaded that um, if it, it qualified one-way cost shifting should uh, not be available in, and it should be specified as not being available in the event that the pursuer has failed to beat a tender. Thank you very much. You actually touched on a few of the other questions that I had there, in particular the, uh, the test in relation to un unreasonable behaviour as well. And I would agree, I mean, in terms of what you said about spurious claims, that certainly echoed with the evidence that we heard um, who, from solicitors who said that, well, they just wouldn't take on the case if they didn't think it was going to get anywhere anyway. So, What I did was a little exercise just to see the sort of outlays which um, the solicitors are going to have to pay. And at the present moment, according to the Scottish Court Service website, um, to raise an action, there has to be an outlay of £214. Every time there is a motion, each party has to pay £54 just to enrol the motion. And then you have to pay £77 per half hour for the proceedings. Now, those payments have to come out of the solicitor's pocket in a damages-based agreement. And that's before you start looking at the costs of the medical reports and the experts' reports, all of which will be in the hundreds, if not the thousands. So I think that is a pretty strong deterrent for frivolous claims taken with the knowledge that the defender can come into court and move some summary dismissal or striking out as more um, vernacular. Thank you for that, that's really helpful. Um, and also, I just want to clarify then, I mean, you touched on tenders there as well, and it was just a bit about uh, that process. So, to clarify that, do you think that is something that should be more clearly defined within the bill? or? Uh... No, I don't think they should deal with what I propose in regard to tenders in the bill, because that's getting into uh, more technical detail. I think that's properly in an act of sedent. Okay. But I think a one line um, that quarks flies off in the event, well, what, what would it be? Um, uh, a person conducts civil proceedings in an, in a, in an, appro in an appropriate manner unless the person fails to beat a pursuer's tender. Okay. I hesitate to draft on the hoof, but something like that. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. If I could just um, go back to the Wednesbury test. Um, as it stands, would it be your position that the, the legislation might catch a weak case as opposed to the test in Wednesbury, which was um, the reasonable person test, so unreasonable? Yes. Um, that, so the wording you've suggested would, would meet that test um, that Wednesbury unreasonable refers to a decision that's so unreasonable no unreasonable uh, person could have reached it. Yes, I, th I, I think so. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, moving on now to Liam McCarthy. Thanks very much, Good morning, Chief Principal. Good morning. Um, turning back to an issue you, you raised, I think, in, in probably your initial response to Liam Kerr in relation to uh, claims management companies. And I suppose one of the red flags that's been raised in relation to um, the situation south of the border in relation to quarks 
which will not be, certainly at the outset, um, in place in, in Scotland is the regulation of claims management companies. Now, the government, both the bill team and their evidence to us, I think acknowledged that issue. We've since had correspondence suggesting that the government may look to piggyback on the, on the um, financial guidance and claims bill um, at, at a UK level. What are your thoughts about the advisability of implementing the provisions in relation to quarks in the absence of that regulation, either through, uh, uh, through the UK bill or through separate legislation flowing from the review that's currently ongoing? I, w I would... I, I can understand why the regulation of claims management companies might be dealt with other than here. Um, I would be content um, f for present purposes when we're talking about damages-based agreements simply to have some provision that only a regulated body can enter into a damages-based agreement. So that would mean that um, claims management companies, until such time as they uh, became regulated, would not be allowed to enter into damages-based agreements. Mm. Um, but my recommendation is that claims management companies fall to be regulated. Um, it's, it's an essential element of this report. Yeah, that and certainly seemed to be the hint that Scottish Government officials were, were, were giving us when, when they were setting out the, the, the objectives of the, of the bill. Um, but to your mind, it would be sufficient to have, for, for the time being, a reference to um, regulated um, organisations or bodies um, and, and, and that will manifest itself either through the changes to the UK legislation or whatever emerges from the, the, the government's... Yes, it, it would be a holding element. It wouldn't be allowed to enter into damages-based agreements, take 20-30% from all loss. Okay. But I, I, I actually think most damages, m most claims management companies will disappear in Scotland because the vast majority of claims management companies in Scotland are simply... Um, fictions because they are firms of solicitors who set up their own tame claims management company. The ownership of the firm of solicitors is the same as the ownership of the claims management company. That's helpful. Thank you. Okay. That's, that's helpful. Um, Mary. No, sorry, Morris next. Thank you, Convener. Um, <coughs> Chairman Principal, um, the defender representatives have argued that the provisions on the quarks uh, and damage-based agreement, uh, agreements will tip the balance too far towards unscrupulous pursuers unless other controls are introduced, such as fixed expenses or more extensive pro-action protocols. Do you agree with these concerns? Pre-action protocols undoubtedly assist in weeding out cases capable of settlement before they get to court. Um, I confess I'm not completely up to speed on what pre-action protocols uh, exist, but as, as a generality, um, they are um, worthwhile. I think they operate just now and are mandatory in all cases up to a value of £25,000. That seems to me to be, if it's working at that, you might think of extending it to cases of 50,000 or 100,000. I would have thought that's the role of the uh, Civil Justice Council, to be monitoring th th these aspects uh, and, dec and deciding at what level the, the um, mandatory pre-action protocol should kick in and, and the sort of actions which should be covered by it. Um, fixed fees, uh, they're a, a bit of an unknown quantity. I mean, I, I dipped my toe in the water of fixed fees by suggesting that in the, what was then to be a new simplified procedure, it should be fixed fees. And I would like to have seen that in operation before I ventured an opinion on whether it worked and therefore should be rolled further out. Mm -hmm. But as a general concept, I like the idea of fixed fees. They operated very successfully in the
the, at one of the patent courts in London, the, it's, it's in my report somewhere, um, the, the key watchwords in this report were, or one of them, was predictability. And fixed fees brings about a predictability. So it's, I, I like the idea of fixed fees. Um, I'm not sure I necessarily tie it in with qualified one-way cost shifting, if that, if no. you follow that. Yeah. In fact, I, I mean, I recommend in here that there should be budgeting of litigations. I, I appreciate it's nothing to do with you, but it, it perhaps gives you the tenor of where I go. In commercial actions, at the outset, each party should set out what they believe the costs of this action will be. Mm -hmm. uh, they get the, the court to approve it, and the court might say, oh, I don't like that, I don't like that. And then they're held to that for the future. And that provides predictability. It, to me, it's, it's unacceptable in this day and age for a, a, a client to say to a, a, a lawyer, how much will this litigation cost me? And he replies, I haven't a clue. How long is a piece of string? It's, it's just not acceptable, and there are ways around it. Thank you. Could I ask about the cold calling aspect of claims management companies? While most of them you think will, will disappear, there still is that, um, that element. And do you have any yeah. comments on that? Well, cold calling is the big mischief of claims management companies. Um, if, if you go back to Jackson, um, if you go back to several sources, it'll, it'll, um, the Conservative peer, Lord Young of Grafham, he carried out an examination of claims management companies. The Legal Services Board in England, they carried out an examination of claims management companies. And save for cold calling, they thought they actually served a useful role in the process. But um, my uh, report um, recommends that case management companies, or anybody for that matter, should not be permitted to cold call. And once you've got a regulator in, then that helps. Um, I recommend that there is a professional duty on a solicitor to, uh, to satisfy himself that before a case is referred to him by a claims management company, that it has not been obtained by means of cold calling. And that will require the law society to firm up um, their professional guidance um, provisions so that if a solicitor does accept a case or doesn't make reasonable inquiry as to whether it was uh, attained by cold calling, it will be professional misconduct. Um, and I would suggest further that only regulated bodies should be entitled to charge a referral fee. Yeah. Because then if you, if, if, if you look at it that way, um, that would do. what incentive is there going to be uh, for a cold, somebody to acquire a, a, a piece of business by cold calling if the regulator is going to come down on top of them? Yeah, that would certainly... Um avoid any problems if the Law Society decided not to implement that. They haven't committed to doing that, to, to inquiring if no. um, the referral came as a, a result of cold calling, but if it's only regulated bodies. But, but I do understand it. that the same bill as you're praying in aid in Westminster uh, in re relation to regulation of claims management companies is going to legislate for uh, a ban on cold calling. So one way or another, hopefully, it's all going to be caught. We hope so. <laughs> I mean, it is the bane of all our lives, is it not? Yes, it certainly is. Mary? Thank you, um, convener. Good morning, Sheriff Principal Taylor. Um, I wanted to ask you about third-party litigation um, funding, because you'll know that there's an emerging market in, in England for investors to, to fund claims for a share of, of, of compensation. 
And th the bill before us would make it um, possible for third party funders to be found um, li liable for, e for expenses. Um, and, and the government have said that it's their intention only to catch commercial third party funders, but we've heard in evidence from particularly trade unions that there is concern that trade unions could be caught up um, in this. And I wonder if you could um, clarify for us who specifically the recommendation on liability for third party funding is meant to catch. It, it, it is intended it, that it is only the venture capitalist coming in to fund a commercial action which um, could find itself liable for the ex adverse costs in a litigation. So the trade union uh, should not be caught and neither should the solicitor who provides a damages-based agreement be caught. Uh, and, but my understanding from having a chat to one of the bill team yesterday is that there's going to be further definition provided to bring about what I think you and I would both choose. Yeah, yeah because I mean, your recommendation was that there should be a voluntary code of practice for, for third party funders. As there is in England and Wales. Yeah, as there is. Um, and, and there is no provision for that in, in, in the bill. But is, is your understanding now that, that something will be coming forward? Uh, I think it's simply changing the <clears throat> one of the definitions in the existing legislation, which would make it clear that trade union movement, uh, trade unions and um, solicitors entering into damages-based agreements would not be caught. I don't think it's going as far as you're suggesting and, and a requirement that there, there should be um, a code of conduct. Mm. But if there's clarity in the bill, that would certainly be helpful for trade it unions. Would, it and, would certainly and, help, and no yes. And no fee solicitors. Yes. Um, section 10 of the bill includes um, requirements on transparency of funding arrangements. And can, can you confirm if you intended these to apply to all parties to civil court action, not just third party funders? Because your um, recommendation was that all parties to civil litigation should be required to disclose to the to others involved how the court action has been funded? Yes. And I and stick that by that. Include, that would include trade unions, all, all, yes. all funders? Yes. I think there should be a disclosure of how the action is being funded. Okay. Thank you for that. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Could I perhaps ask you about the definition you provided as a professional funder, which seemed to me um, really caught it quite nicely, a funder motivated by a desire to make a profit who effectively purchases a stake in the outcome of the litigation. Would that That's in the definition section yeah. of... Would that serve the purpose if that definition was replace, replacing the one in the... One second, I will look at it. It's paragraph 57, chapter 11. Third... <clears throat> I'm, I'm in the glossary at the beginning, Roman 14. The funding of litigation by a party who has no pre-existing interest in the litigation, usually on the basis that one, the funder will be paid out of the proceeds of any amounts recovered as a consequence of the litigation, often express a percentage of something recovered, and two, the funder is not entitled to payment should the claim fail. No, I don't think that helps us particularly. Well, could, you, could you give me the number which it's um, chapter 11, paragraph 57 of your review. It seemed a nice, neat... It would be a bit, bit embarrassing if I had to go back <laughs> in it now, wouldn't it? Um, a professional funder who finances part of a person. Funder motivated by a desire to make a profit. Who effectively purchases stake in the outcome of litigation. Second sentence in paragraph 57. I'm I think that's fine. The reasoning. Oh. I think that meets the point, doesn't it? Yes, I think so. I think it's yeah. excellent. Okay. Liam Kerr, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Convener. Just briefly, if I may, um, I'd like to take you right back to the start and the basis of this whole process. In paragraph 43 of chapter 8 of the report, uh, you talk about individuals being put off from pursuing legitimate claims for fear of an award of expenses against them. Uh, do you have any idea as to how many of these pursuers exist? Is there any evidence that it's the fear 
of an award against them that is putting them off. Uh, and just something that sprung to mind, it, it, if the claim is legitimate, to use the, the, the specific word there, why would the individual have an award of cost made against them? And shouldn't the solicitor be saying, you're okay on this, go forward? Well, there is no doubt in my mind from my time in private practice that the fear of an adverse award of costs inhibits people from exercising their legal rights. I can speak to that personally. I've had a claim valued at 30,000. My prospects of success were probably about 80%. I settled my action at 10,000, one third of what it was worth. And I did it entirely on the basis that I thought I had before the event in Tudens. I didn't, that's my fault. And the thought of an, an award of expenses well into six figures, which is what it would have taken to litigate the 30,000 pound claim, um, simply wasn't in my or my family's interest. So it has deterred me from litigating. It certainly deterred a lot of my clients from litigating. Uh, so I have absolutely no doubt that it is a deterrence. Now, that deals with part of your question. What was the other part? I'm sorry. Uh, the, the, the second one was just something that bounced in my mind. We, you, you talk about, in, in the particular paragraph, pursuing legitimate claims. Uh, but if a claim is really legitimate, why would there be an award of costs against the pursuer? Well, you think it's legitimate at the outset. The pursuer comes in to see you in, in your office and he gives you one set of facts. Now, he may be perfectly honest in his uh, assessment of the facts, but some witnesses are not just that very good at remembering what happened two or three weeks ago, particularly if there has been some trauma. In fact, there's been quite a lot of research carried out into the effect of trauma on memory. And so whilst the solicitor may be told that this um, is a pretty strong case and take it on, the, the, the assessment of its prospects of success must be kept under continuous um, monitoring be, because they change all the time. It starts off as good, but can easily uh, turn to very poor. And the damages-based agreements into which solicitors enter make provision for them being able to back out if, if it reaches the stage where the case is no longer a viable case. Mm -hmm. Does that, have, have I answered your point? With, with very great respect, Sheriff Principal, I'm not sure that that does answer the point. Uh, it, it was just that uh, what you said is that individuals are put off, so they themselves make a decision from pursuing a legitimate claim. Yes. Uh, and so they, when they present to you, they believe it's a legitimate claim. Yes. Uh, but they are now being put off because the solicitor says, OK, I've heard your side of the tale. Um, seems legitimate on the facts. Uh, as you've presented them, uh, but this is what it's going to cost. Uh, and at that stage... No, it's not usually at that stage that it happens. What hap I mean, <clears throat> the So which stage are they put off well, the solicit legitimate claim? It's, it's when, you, it's when, you, you've, when you realise that negotiation is not going to produce a result and therefore you're going to have to go into court. Because an adverse award of costs, the clock only starts ticking when you get into court. So you, in the circumstances which you um, have put forward, of course the solicitor would write to whoever the alleged wrongdoer was and hopefully a negotiation would then ensue, by which time one gets a fairer idea of how the land lies from both sides. And Rarely, rarely is there uh, a monopoly of right on one party. 
and it is at the point when you start to go in, when you have to go into court because the negotiation has proved uh, unfruitful, then you've got to say, well, if you lose, you've you've um, got the the risk of of, of um, a, a severe adverse award of expenses, which could, in many cases, bankrupt the individual. Thank you. Could I perhaps ask you about two of your recommendations, which aren't on the face of the bill, but um, you made. One was the additional fee, the extra amount in judicial expenses that a judge can, warn, uh, can award where the case has been particularly complex or time-consuming. Um, and I think you suggested the additional fee should be continued to be decided by the judge at the end of the case, but recommend it should be limited to 100% uplift of the judicial expense amount. Should that be on the face of the bill or should it be regulated in some other way? I th that, that is probably best dealt with by um, secondary legislation. But it should be something that's um, built into yes. the session. Yes, and I would also suggest that when 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 a judge is asked to make a decision uh, w with regard to an additional fee, um, there are a series of factors which have to be taken into account: the complexity of the case, um, and I can't remember them all off. There's about half a dozen. And I would suggest that the provision should also now be expanded to um, f require the judge to consider the extent by which the pursuer solicitor is being remunerated by way of a success fee. That's, that's helpful. The other one was the role of the solicitor, again, not in the face of the bill, but maybe something that should most certainly be looked at, where you recommended that solicitors should be required to discuss all potential funding options with their client, and that this should include um, things like legal aid or an existing insurance policy, and that they should write to the client with their recommendation and the reasons for this. Yes. Um, Lord Justice Jackson recommended that before a damages-based agreement was entered into, the solicitor about to enter into the agreement had to refer the client to an independent solicitor to have make sure that all the pros and cons had been properly explained. And I thought that was just a bit of overkill mm -hmm. and a bit of too much administration. So this is the a watered down version, if you like, of, of what Jackson recommended. And I think it's important that, firstly, to realize that damages-based agreements is not removing any other funding mechanism from the legal landscape, uh, and it is an additional one, and, but it might not be best suited for the, the particular pursuer. No, and and, and it's just occurred to me about um, qualified one-way cost shifting. What I should have tried to work into one of my answers is we already have qualified one-way cost shifting in Scotland. It has been in operation for decades and it involves the legal aid fund because a legal aid, legally aided pursuer who loses an action and therefore would have the potential for an adverse award of expenses that doesn't have an adverse award of expenses made against them. In very, very exceptional circumstances, uh, the successful unassisted party can obtain payment of expenses out of the legal aid fund. But I'm sure all around the table will appreciate that it will be in very, very limited circumstances that such applies. So we don't really need to wonder how qualified one-way cost shifting is going to work. We already know how it works, albeit in a very limited environment in Scotland.
Yeah, I'm sure that will um, provide um, huge uh, reassurance to people who are, who are a bit worried about this um, this legislation. But I think we, we're all agreed from the committee today. Your evidence session has been immensely helpful to us. And can I thank both you and uh, Ms. Samuel for attending committee today. And with that, um, I suspend briefly to allow for a change of witnesses and a comfort break of five minutes.
Agenda item three is the stage two evidence session on the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill. And I refer members to paper six, which is a note by the clerk, and papers seven and eight, which are spice papers. Can I begin by welcoming uh, Gillian Maudsley, executive, um, policy executive, Law Society of Scotland. And particularly thank you for standing in at the last moment for Gracia Robertson, who I had to, to attend court. Thank you. And Detective Superintendent Gordon McCready, Public Protection Police Scotland, Dr. Marsha Scott, Chief Executive Scotland's Women's Aid, and Professor Mandy Burton, School of Law, University of Leicester. And can I thank the, the witnesses for supplying your, um, providing your written submissions, which were, as always, really helpful for the committee. We now move to, move to questions, starting with John Finney. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel, and, and thanks, thanks for your submission. I want to talk about the current p powers, and pr probably initially for yourself, uh, uh, Detective Superintendent, and about investigation, and, and, and then maybe prosecution, and then just one other point before moving on to others. Can I ask uh, about the, the position, please, where police officers are investigating allegations of domestic abuse, in what circumstances the alleged abusers might, A, be detained in custody until a first appearance or be, be released on undertakings with conditions which exclude them from the victim's home? So, so currently, where there is a sufficiency of evidence uh, when officers have conducted thorough inquiries, there are primarily two options available. The, the first is to charge and keep somebody in custody. Um, where there is a risk assessment undertaken and there is a sufficiency of risk, with quite strict criteria laid out in the joint protocol with Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service and informed by Lord Advocate's guidelines, they will be kept in custody. Currently about uh, four out of five of persons with sufficiency of evidence are kept in custody to appear at court. By affording somebody an appearance at court, that allows the court to impose uh, bail conditions, which then leads to our enforcement of same bail conditions and affords a victim some protection um, and space to breathe. The second option really is undertaking. So where the risk assessment is carried out and there is a belief that the risk to the victim is on the lower side of the scale and where certain criteria are met, we can release an accused person on undertaking to appear at court approximately 14 days after charge. So there is some due diligence and speed associated with that. That also affords us the opportunity to impose police bail conditions. Again, these are equally impactive as the court bail conditions. It is a criminal offence to breach these conditions. And it can prohibit or exclude a person making contact. So in that respect, where there's a sufficiency of evidence, we currently have powers to act. And can I just clarify, please, in respect of each of these occasions where you mentioned risk assessment, is this a generic risk assessment or is it specific to the circumstances whereby this individual has come to the police attention? There is a domestic abuse risk assessment <coughs> uh, within Police Scotland. It's known as the Domestic Abuse Questions or the DAC. Um, it's based on academic research. It ties into many of our partner agencies' risk assessment models um, and it informs us the risk the victim may face. So it takes account of circumstances where we know there may be an escalation. So, for instance, we know that pregnancy or recent childbirth is usually a good indicator that a person may be of increased risk. We know that strangulation is a method used uh, clearly to show an intent of harm towards a person. Um, there are other academically informed questions which form that domestic abuse risk assessment. I don't know if the other panel members want to comment on that particular aspect. Or... Um, hi, John. Uh, I think I'll just add um, uh, to what Detective Superintendent, did I get that right? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, McCready has said, which is that uh, there are absolutely measures, and, and I think fairly robustly undertaken um, in Scotland um, <clears throat> when police are involved, but I think it's really important to point out that uh, Istanbul Convention Article 52 requirements um, for EBOs, as well as some of the, the surrounding information in the document on emergency barring orders and situations of domestic violence, point out that EBOs should not be restricted to cases of high risk um, and that 
uh, I, I would say that uh, as an organization that works with victims um, routinely, that our confidence in that instrument is definitely um, uh, framed by the fact that it is only a risk assessment. Um, it is based on academic evidence that has to do with predicting um, uh, women's murders, which is a really very horrific event, but quite a small percentage of the harm that's done to women and children in the context of domestic abuse. So it's a useful tool, but it is not a panacea for assessing or preventing risk. And I think the, the key point that Istanbul makes that I would really like to emphasize here is that EBOs need to be seen as, some, as a tool that would help prevent harm as well as to be used in the context when a crime has already been committed. And I think the police's hands are somewhat tied by having to be focused on whether a crime has been committed, um, whereas an ABO can be used in a, a wider area of, of uh, events. Thank you. I, I think there's going to be more detailed questions uh, further on sure. about that particular aspect. If I can move it to the next stage, then... Yeah. Supplementaries, if you don't mind, yeah. John, uh, Rona, and then uh, Stuart. Yes, hi, good morning. Um, just to, um, D.S. McCready, just to ask just on the, the question of bail and risk assessment. I know this might be hard for you to answer, but in your opinion, your experience, how successful are those risk assessments? Do most of the time, does it work out or, you know? Uh, it's very difficult to say. We know that uh, it can prevent escalation in some cases. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, when this is a risk assessment, there will always be an element of it's risk. It's not an exact science. It's not an exact yeah. science. We can mitigate risk, and that's probably one of the most important things we do with a victim of mm -hmm. domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. It's about victim safety planning, putting in place some trigger to protect them and prevent them from coming to further harm, mm -hmm. but there will always be yeah. a degree of risk. Just trying to get an idea of, of how, what the scale of you know, your sort of success rate with that is, but as, as yeah, we can say that, so we, we carry out um, uh, domestic abuse bail checks. So when a perpetrator mm -hmm. has been released from police custody, um, we will visit the victim within 24 hours. We will signpost them to appropriate services. We will um, ensure that some support mechanisms are in place. And importantly, where possible, we'll carry out a check of the premises to make sure a perpetrator is not present. We know that 3% of those crimes convert to um, Three percent of those visits convert to a crime being detected. So, in ninety-seven percent of the cases, those those we could suggest that in the first twenty-four hours, that bail condition is operating effectively. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Uh, and Stuart, on the investigation, um, I investigation. just wanted to ask a week, and it's purely for the uh, detective uh, superintendent um, about police bail. Um, we we are looking at domestic abuse here. I take it that when a police bail with conditions that is designed to protect the victim, that the victim will be told of what those bail conditions are. Yes, yes, it's, it's, it's explicitly uh, clear. The victim must be informed about the bail conditions um, primarily so that they know yes. if a uh, perpetrator is seen out with their premises, they know that that's in breach of bail. It affords them a sense of comfort and security, we hope to allow them to plan for getting appropriate support or taking whichever steps they feel necessary to move forward in their own particular circumstance. And is, is, is that a general thing the police would do where there are bail conditions to protect an individual out with the domestic abuse but other similar circumstances? I just ask that because I have an experience of an example where the, it was only when it went to court many months later and the fiscal told the victim that it became apparent that bail conditions had been in place. Um, so VIA, which is part of the Procurator Fiscal Service, uh, Victim Information and Advice, where a person appears at court, uh, do notify of bail conditions. Yeah. The police are particularly um, crucial in domestic abuse, but ideally any person who is protected by bail conditions should know. That's fine. Thank you, Kim. Probably allowed the supplementaries that have preempted some of what you were going no, to no, ask, no, but um, if if you carry on. If we move to the situation then where the decision has been taken to prosecute someone, um, I, I, what circumstances might they be remanded in custody after appearing? And perhaps we're not talking about the first appearance in that case. Um, 
or released in bail with conditions excluding them from the victim's home. What are the, the factors surrounding that, please? Okay. Um, the first thing to say is, obviously, the police will report a case to the procurator fiscal, and the procurator, with, for instance, the person in custody, the perpetrator in custody, the fiscal has to make an assessment of the information that's been supplied to ensure that a crime known to the law of Scotland plus sufficient, there's sufficient evidence to proceed with a complaint or a petition, depending whether it's solemn or summary. At that stage, the case will call in court, be it again, petition or summary, in front of a sheriff. And the Crown will, looking at the factors, decide whether to oppose bail or not. The question of bail will be a matter for the sheriff. So that's the outline of the procedure with regard to, if you like, the hearing. At the time when bail is being considered, you ask specifically what sort of factors would apply. There are standard conditions of bail, which include not to approach and interfere with witnesses, to turn up at court on specific dates, etc. There are about five or six standard conditions that are imposed in every situation that someone will be granted bail from a court case. However, if someone is going to be granted bail in a domestic abuse case, I would normally have expected to see a requirement for additional or what you might call special conditions. These special conditions will vary, but they will normally comprise not to approach or contact person A, the victim. It may well be not to enter a street, a particular street, or attend a particular locus. So these conditions will be spelt out in full and invariably, if bail is being granted, the sheriff will ensure that all the bail conditions have been spelt out and, and also explain the special or additional conditions as well. And the reason I say that is because this question of approach or contact can be misunderstood by people. Contact means contact by any means, including obviously social media, texting and things like that. And the person will not be granted bail unless they accept these specific conditions. So that's with regard to where they're being granted. Clearly, if they're going to, if bail is being opposed, it may be opposed for a number of reasons. His record, the number of times there has been a failure to turn up at court, the seriousness of the offence, the likelihood of reoffending. There will be a number of factors put forward to support opposition to bail. Clearly, from the defence perspective for the perpetrator, there may be points put forward why bail should be granted. Ultimately, it's for the sheriff or the judge to decide whether bail will be granted. Obviously, if bail is refused, he will be remanded in custody pending trial. There are time limits clearly for summary trials, petition time limits obviously in solemn as well. If, however, the, he is granted bail and the Crown are opposed to that, they may well seek to lodge an appeal and he'll be kept in custody until that appeal hearing can be heard by the Sheriff Appeal Court. Okay, Does thank that you cover that. some of the information you're looking for? Yes, indeed. Marcia. Uh, that, that was a really comprehensive description of what it says on the tin, but what women and children tell us routinely is that um, there's a bit of a postcode lottery in Scotland around whether you're going to get special bail conditions and the, the um, robustness of response when they're breached. Um, so. I think like, like with EBOs, we don't think that any um, criminal justice intervention is going to fix an entire problem, but I think what we're advocating for is multiple tools in the toolkit. Um, and certainly the problem with uh, the understanding that there is only risk when the, the victim and perpetrator are cohabitating is very much something that we see regularly. So if um, if they're not living in the same uh, uh, house or flat, then often people assume that risk is, is diminished and are much less likely to be robust about either special bail conditions or breaches. But in fact, as I'm sure you all know, the 
highest amount of risk of murder of women and children is, is when they are not living together or when she's seeking to leave the, the relationship. So it is really, really important that we have emergency mechanism to protect the, the women and children from, uh, in their own home. And, and I think that uh, this, this is one of the th conditions would be to, f to look at where are there legal and, and police gaps at the moment, and this might fill one of them. Yes, Professor Barton. In, in relation to bail conditions, <coughs> the other issue as well, the threshold for making uh, bail conditions might actually require that there's a history of violence between the parties, mm -hmm. whereas with emergency bar orders, the idea is that you could um, have such an order even when there's not a history of violence. So the threshold for bail conditions can be higher than for an emergency barring order. Okay. Can I ask a, a general question to all the panel? The, 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 the existence of children as a result of the relationship, does that in any way complicate any of the decision-making that we've discussed? Please. I would certainly say, and you all have heard me talk quite a bit about the influence of keeping children safe on women's decision making um, and the need to see children as victims of domestic abuse. Um, so certainly what, uh, what we would recommend is that any barring order would need to cover the children um, and that the barring order is, is about, um, is, would need to be seen as part of a suite of protection orders that would allow children both cover their their domestic environment, but also them in in you know school settings or those kinds of settings. And so we know that some EBOs in Europe don't but cover with the, children. With existing um, arrangements, um, setting aside what we will come on to, but with existing arrangements, does the fact that there are children alter judicial decisions, perhaps, or police decisions? Well, there's, I think there's quite a bit of evidence that, that courts are reluctant to um, uh, interfere in custody and visitation arrangements, um, and so might be less likely then to impose sanctions in which um, perpetrators are, are no longer have access to their children. But we think with a temporary order, the, the balance of rights in this situation um, should come down on the side of safety. If I can speak on behalf of the police, um, the police are very mindful of the safety of children, but equally, where a child is not a direct victim in the crime, we know that there is a debate about access to children. And I think we have to be mindful of that. We have seen some conflicting uh, opinions on that in the past, but where there is an immediate concern for the safety of the child, the police will impose bail conditions which reflect that if it is available to them as a result of a sufficiency of evidence. And Julian Mosley. Yeah. I would just echo the point about bail conditions. Clearly, the bail conditions, the, the additional ones that can be imposed, can specifically state the names of children as well. The general bail conditions would also be not to interfere with witnesses, because I'm thinking of a situation where quite often in domestic abuse, it may well be the children that have witnessed and may well be effectively requiring to give evidence. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mary, supplementary? Supplementary to that, and it was about the uh, emergency barring orders and, and that covering children that, uh, Dr Scott, you touched on. Um, I, and it was really just to find out about examples from other countries where that is the case and how, how that seems to be operating. I, I don't know if, uh, Professor Burton, if you had any information on that. Yes, I mean, Austria is one of the countries in Europe that's had emergency barring orders for the longest. They've had them since 1997. Originally, when they were introduced, um, they only applied to the adult victim and the place where she lived. But recently, more recently, um, they've extended them to places where the children go to, so childcare centres, kindergartens, to specifically um, acknowledge that it's not just where the adult victim lives and goes that needs to be covered, but also children, where the children go and where the, where the carer's going to collect the children, etc. So there are models in Europe where orders cover both the adult mm. victim and the child victims of abuse. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mary Supplementary. Thank you, Convener. I just wanted um, a bit of brief clarification from, from DS McCready on the point you made about protecting children um, and the importance of protecting um, children. How would you determine the level of risk from a child? If a child had not been directly subjected to some sort of violence, do you carry out a risk assessment? How, how do you determine the level of risk a child is at? 
I think there is a professional judgment uh, which police officers undertake. There is also uh, quite a significant concern review. So every domestic abuse incident the police attend, there will be um, a, a report submitted about the circumstances. That will be reviewed uh, by professionals to assess the level of risk. Is there, if there is any immediacy around that risk, the police will act at the time to mitigate the risk as best as possible. But each of these um, incidents in which we attend are subject to subsequent scrutiny to consider the wider circumstances of the case. So if there's not an immediate risk to a child, can, can you give us any idea the time frame that it would take to review and, and make a further determination? I would expect that to be the next day. Right. OK, thank you. Ian MacArthur. Thank you, Kavina. Um, just following on from, from John Finney's line of questioning, I, I suppose I know the answer to this, but I'll, I'll ask the question anyway. In, in terms of the powers currently available to the police and the criminal courts, could those realistically be amended in order to plug some of the, the, the gaps that have been identified? I guess um, we look to England and Wales, as we often do, um, and they have domestic violence prevention notices, which are implemented by a superintendent or above, followed by a domestic violence prevention order. Um, I think from Police Scotland's position, we welcome this discussion. We have some concerns about that specific uh, piece of legislation in as much as whilst a victim's safety is critical, it does impose a significant financial burden on the services in England and Wales, talking uh, in the region of £1,000 per, per order, and it is a very short time frame for which a superintendent can authorise, so 48 hours uh, in the first instance for the domestic violence protection notice. Um, and that places some burden. So I think if we were to go down a route uh, seeking to fill the gap through legislation, that I would suggest uh, we would recommend that it uh, be considered from a financial impact, um, not just the process of going through courts, if that was the route taken, but the administrative uh, burden because we would need an increased problem in legal services. But, but from that, I take it that um, a, a, a variant of a, a, a barring order um, uh, is, is, to your mind, essential to, to plug an existing gap, albeit that you have some concerns about the way that that would apply, the, the duration, the threshold, um, the, 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 the costs that would be incurred. I, I think... As I've outlined, we have a, where we have a sufficiency of evidence, we currently have powers. Where there is no sufficiency of evidence, do the police find themselves working with third partner, uh, third sector organisations to ensure the safety of the victim, to mitigate risk? And on occasion, very small number of occasions, in our mind, that may displace a victim from their home address. Whether or not there is a need to legislate um, is a matter for the committee. Um, I think it is worthy of note that there would be an administrative burden upon the police. However, the police may not be the only competent authority the committee may be decide to authorise and to um, seek an EBO if that was the way they were minded. Do the panel members have a view on that? Um, just to add quickly for me, um, that uh, I think our concerns are that all the existing mechanisms depend on um, women to carry the burden um, or the victims to carry the burden um, uh, of uh, establishing whatever the mechanism is for protection. Sometimes there's a financial cost to them. And, uh, you know, f we, have, we have libraries of evidence that the existing provisions are not used for a variety of reasons. And I think trying to fix something that's not working in the first place is possibly not um, the, the best route forward. And what, what we're looking for is a mechanism that would be significantly different in the sense that women would be offered the opportunity to, to say yay or nay, but they wouldn't be responsible for making it happen in the context of an emergency situation, which the other existing um, uh, provisions do. Just on that point, I mean, you've, you've argued for having a, a suite of measures, and I think, Professor Burton, you talked about the lower threshold that, that allows EBOs to, to apply in circumstances which, which don't in relation to the powers at the, at the moment. But there have been examples of the way EBOs have been operated where the victim um, 
doesn't have a great deal of control about the way in which the EBO is, um, uh, is applied, which would, to some extent, counter what you're saying in relation to the, the, the advantage of EBOs being that it, it, it takes some of the, the, the pressure off um, the woman or the, or the victim in that instance. I mean, I, I th we come down on the side of um, uh, asking women's permission, and, and that's because there's, there's a fair amount of evidence, and I, I think Professor Burton can probably give you the, the citations for this, that women are the best predictor of further harm. They don't, they're not good at predicting their own murder, but you know, short of that, they are. And so for perpetrators who are not likely to abide by the law, um, get it, investing in, in a... In a uh, a measure that requires them to do so um, is, is in, the, in you know, some victims' minds, uh, A, a waste, and B, makes other people think they're safe when they know they're not. Mm -hmm. So we think it's an important mechanism that needs to be in place. But I'm also very mindful that there's a, there's a broad discussion about them and the EBOs that exist across Europe, um, some require women's consent and, and, and some don't. Uh, many don't require victims' consent and um, leave it to the police to consult victims but have their views as non-binding because there may be some in instances where the competent authority takes the view that um, it's in the interest of the victim for an order to be made even though it's not what they actually express their view uh, to be. However, I think there's a great difficulty with enforcement of emergency barring orders if they are made without the victim's consent because in order to enforce a, an order you will normally need evidence of a breach and you won't get evidence of a breach unless the victim comes forward to do that unless you have some other proactive way of monitoring compliance for example electronic tagging um, of the perpetrator so in practice, although many European countries don't require the consent of a victim for the making of an order, in reality to enforce it, the cooperation of a victim is required. Although that's not inconsistent with the bill as a whole, where mm -hmm. in a sense it's recognised that simply waiting for a complaint from the victim before acting is the necessary trigger, where it, mm -hmm. in some instances the victim will almost be the last to acknowledge um, that there is a, is a problem that needs to be addressed. So in that respect those shortcomings of the EBO are not inconsistent with other aspects mm. of the, the bill within... within and the EBO say. does have the significant advantage in that it doesn't rely on the victim having the resources, either financial or other resources, to seek protection on their, their own behalf. Of course, so there are resource implications. Yeah. The resource issue shifts around the system. It shifts to the police, who then have the administrative burden uh, of doing it. But the victim doesn't have to have the financial or other resources to get the protection. Right. So, I, I, as well as answering that, could you maybe address the, the other um, concern that the, the EBOs might potentially be abused, and, and is that a, a risk that you, you recognise? And if so, what would, what would those risks be? If we take it one step back, I'd endorse what the Detective Superintendent McCready said, is if there's a gap, clearly it's a matter for the committee to decide how to address that. And there could be a gap where there's insufficiency of evidence, that's all I would say. Now, I do highlight that the criminal justice is about to change with the provisions that are coming into force in, in January, which will give the police additional powers of investi in investigative liberation, which the detective sergeant has spoken about. So I'm not sure what the implications of that in what could be seen to be quite a complex landscape to deal with the question of domestic abuse. Coming to were the committee minded to make some kind of an order, the one uh, thing I think we'd want to stress is a determination of whether it goes down a criminal or a civil route. And if you like, probably looking at it from the point of view of its immediacy, the concern that we had was over the period of time before there could be judicial or independent review of any measure or power that came into force. So if the power came into force that somebody, a perpetrator, was prevented from going back how soon would that be subject to an independent review by a, a judge, by a court measure? And the one thing we were going to put in to suggest was a possibility you have on call sheriffs dealing with warrant applications over weekends and over periods. Whether there was a court 
process that could be devised in situations of where there's insufficient evidence perhaps to proceed or there was an imminency of risk. That's one thing I would put forward. Um, and related to that is a question of technology clearly coming and what might be available for online procedures. So that was one thing we wanted to say about the possibility of how to administer them. I don't know what the risk of them being abused. Clearly, um, you, we have problems with bail conditions at the moment, even when they're imposed. I have certainly been aware of circumstances where the person's been allowed back in breach of bail conditions. So that's really all that I could say for myself. If there was some further information, obviously happy to supply it, but I'm not sure that we would be in the best position to give information about what the likely abuse, other than we are aware people potentially change their mind and people are back together again, indeed, before the police can even go and tell about the bail conditions. But Detective Sergeant might be in the best position to comment, Detective Superintendent might be in the best position to comment on that. Apologies. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so in terms of people abusing conditions, I think we have to acknowledge that uh, domestic abuse is a complex uh, circumstance which involves controlling behaviours so whilst um, many lay members of the public would be um, accepted that they may not understand these complexities, we, we see it as something which happens uh, regularly within the service um, and for which we look to the third sector to support victims over the longer period, to inform them about their rights, about uh, the fact that they are subject to domestic abuse and support them in changing their mindset if they are in fact a victim. I mean, it was more about the, the misuse of EBOs rather than the, the abuse of, of the, the, the terms, either of bail conditions or of EBOs. The, the point in terms of um, uh, sort of court, court oversight of, of, of EBOs, the, the, the 48 hours, is that, is that seen as um, a, a reasonable length of time given the threshold or should we be looking at something that is um, higher, significantly higher than that or longer than that in terms of... From, from a police perspective, um, we recognise already that domestic abuse takes at least 20% of our operational policing time. So it's a significant commitment. We're attending a domestic incident every nine minutes. The new bill is likely to increase the, the powers available to the police and the offences um, which are available for charge. So that additional burden is likely to increase. Um, I think if we do, if the committee is minded to legislate for this, then we would ask that any administrative burden is as light as possible. And I acknowledge uh, the suggestion about the use of an on-call sheriff, which is not uh, dissimilar to what we would do for urgent warrant applications. However, I guess that is for the committee to consider. So. The evidence is that 48 hours isn't enough. Um, England and Wales is one of the shortest duration police issued orders, most are between a, a week and one month. Um, and the pilot is that in that situations where the, the police are making the, the yes, initial decision? when police are making the order. The pilot study of emergency barring orders in England and Wales suggested that the reason why the longer orders weren't being applied for was that the police found it too bureaucratic and the time constraints were too limited. So um, it was recommended for England and Wales that the period of the police issued order was extended to four to seven days um, because 48 hours is, is not enough. Can I just um, add that um, in terms of your question about where they are abused, as far as I know, and I did, I did a little check with our, our academic expert here, but we have no evidence of uh, significant or systematic abuse of EBOs. By, um, so I, th I think it's really important for us to, to put that to the side. Um, I would also like to just, just point out that I think it's really important that we think of this as a... Um, uh, uh, something that constrains perpetrators or accused behavior and, and abandon this notion that somehow victims are held responsible for allowing or not allowing perpetrators um, uh, back in. I think that the complexity of the decision about safety of women and children and, and their responses to perpetrators um, uh, is, 
is very uh, often not visible on the surface, but uh, if you look at the, the qualitative evidence around how women make those decisions about whether to take him back or not, um, they are uh, very often based on an assessment that the rest of the community will not protect them. Yeah. I was a bit concerned with your constant use of the word burden, Detective Superintendent. I, I, I'm sure you wouldn't, I, I know there's a very robust approach taken by Police Scotland in relation to domestic violence and it's changed considerably over the years. I just wonder that, and, and again, any, any reticence about additional powers, that's not normal, uh, normally what we hear from police service. I wonder if there were uh, uh, better, better powers that were able to control offenders if that would reduce the likelihood of repetition, clearly as part of a wider education programme, would you see a benefit connected with that? Whether or not orders would um, limit repeat or recidivism, um, I think uh, has been matter of um, limited uh, scrutiny in England and Wales and possibly beyond uh, in Europe. However, I'm probably not the best to comment on that. In respect to your comments about burden, you're absolutely right. I think just for clarity, we are talking about administrative and financial. Uh, Police Scotland absolutely welcomes the discussion on, the, on victim safety and we already work very closely with partner organisations to uh, make or reduce the harm caused by domestic abuse. But surely a preventative approach, and you could view um, some of these measures as a preventative approach, will ultimately reduce the financial and administrative burden, burden as you describe it, in the future. Yes, so th this, uh, this would fall under secondary prevention because in all likelihood we know that an offence is either escalating or has been committed. So ideally we would, as a community, want to focus on primary prevention, but as a service, when we, are, we become involved, we do need the necessary powers to protect the public. At the current time where there's a sufficiency of evidence, we have powers, we believe. We recognise that at the, with the position where there is an insufficiency, we have no power to exclude a person from their home. OK, thank you. That's it. Fulton. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Before I go on to my, my main question, I just wanted to pick up on points that uh, Mary and uh, Mary had um, mentioned earlier, and just to get a bit of clarity from uh, DS McCready. When a child is involved and there's a charge of domestic uh, violence against the perpetrator, is it your understanding that um, the children are referred to social work and the children's reporter as direct course of that? As a matter of course, sorry. So reports will be submitted and they'll be shared with appropriate services, including social work, where children are present. Yep. And, and the children's reporter, is it usual standard to refer an instance straight to the reporter? I would have to check uh, the current process, in fairness, um, and I can come back to you on that. Okay, thanks. I, I, my, own, my own understanding is that, it, uh, that that is the case, but I just thought it was useful to, to get on record. In terms of my main question, Convener, um, do the panel think that the introduction of EBOs might in any way remove the focus uh, of prosecution um, of domestic abuse or the, or the pursuit of, uh, of prosecuting these offences? It can be a quick answer if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I think I know it. I think, I think from a police perspective, uh, we are committed to, to enforcement and, and trying to reduce the harm caused by domestic abuse. We have a tiered structure, uh, both uh, set within local policing uh, with a, an escalation to divisionally based domestic abuse investigation units and um, the top tier of our response, the Domestic Abuse Task Force, which we uh, commonly describe as dealing with the worst of the worst. So we are committed to enforcement. I think that has been outlined uh, since the inception of Police Scotland and I, for one, do not see that changing. I'll just add that... Um I suppose our, our uh, caveat around our general, obvious, as you can tell, support for EBOs um, is that uh, we think it's really important that we learn from the, the not very positive experience of many um, uh, of our services down in England and Wales in terms of the current response, because many, the, the feedback that we're getting is that um, th their experience of it is that it, police and other um, uh, actors in the community see the, the presence of a protection order as, oh, well, now the job's done and we can, and, and, and I think as you're alluding to, might in fact um, uh, dilute 
the robustness of the criminal justice response. So we would, we would be very clear that we would not see um, the, the presence of this kind of a protection order uh, as intended to in any way inhibit gathering of evidence, putting cases to the, to the Crown Office um, or prosecution. And, and in, in fact, if we have another mechanism for allowing uh, other actors in the community to come around and help provide a plan and safety, the evidence that is then gathered in an, in an appropriate context, um, I think, uh, is more helpful to a prosecution case. And I think there's some evidence around this in the, in the research that you did. Yes, I, I think it's very clear that emergency barring orders are meant to be a supplement rather than a replacement for the criminal law. But uh, there is concern that they might be used as a replacement rather than a supplement. If we look at the experience in Germany, um, which has various different models being a federal state, there is some suggestion that with emergency, the introduction of emergency barring orders that the criminal justice response became less robust and that cases weren't built so strongly to take through the criminal law. So I think it is something that has to be monitored when emergency barring orders are introduced to make sure that they're being used as a supplement rather than a replacement. And there isn't that much evidence yet from England and Wales because obviously uh, when the evaluation was carried out, it was only for a short duration. So we don't really know whether they are being used as a, as a replacement rather than a supplement, but it's certainly a concern that ought to be taken into account. I think the point to stress here is that if a crime has been committed, however that crime is defined in the new domestic abuse bill or whatever, and there is sufficient evidence, the criminal justice system will proceed on the basis as it does at the moment, where there are safeguards in respect of bail conditions that can be applied. I think where your emergency barring orders come in is where that position cannot be achieved. There has not been sufficient evidence, either sufficient evidence by corroboration, or there has not been sufficient to constitute a crime. And that's the role that I think that is a gap that we're talking about today, where emergency barring orders would be a route or some similar measure. And all I would say in relation to that is remember there are other civil remedies uh, or civil measures existing at the moment that obviously have been alluded to how effective they are or not. You've got interdict and you've got the non-harassment orders, which obviously exist in parallel to the criminal law system and doesn't diminish the prosecutions that take place for domestic abuse at the moment. Okay, thanks. Uh, that was uh, quite useful responses. Um, just a, a final question, convener. Um, do the panel have any thoughts on how EBOs might be used uh, in other situations where a person has not been investigated or prosecuted for domestic abuse? That I don't think I got the whole thing. So, um, have, have you got any ideas how an EBO might be used um, in another situation where a person has not been prosecuted for domestic abuse? So a situation where perhaps, I suppose it's a, the reverse of the question that we had the, the last thing there, it's a situation where there might not be a sufficiency of evidence to prosecute, but there might be a sufficiency to bring forward a, an EBO. So the person hasn't been taken forward for prosecution, domestic abuse, but maybe the various agencies that are around, women's aid, mm -hmm. social work, etc., are saying there's a level of concern here, and perhaps through multi-agency planning. I think that's kind of the, the line I'm, I'm asking about. I think it's one of the compelling reasons to, to think about doing EBOs is that, uh, again, come back to the, the, my response to the first question, which is um, if they're done in the, in the context of uh, risk, not just um, commission of a crime, then, in fact, uh, they may serve as a deterrence, and they, uh, particularly if we can have them of sufficient length so that um, a, a, a safety uh, network can be uh, put in place and, and for those um, accused or perpetrators who, who will abide by the law, um, it may well be a deterrent in, of some strength. But, and at the moment, you know, we're reliant on a crime being committed and sufficiency of evidence. So, so I do think that it's certainly a broader and more preventative uh, mechanism. 
And it may be a more effective way of getting victims to engage with other support services, particularly if part of the process for making an emergency barring order is that there is a referral to other support agencies that the victim otherwise wouldn't have contacted on their own behalf. I take it from what we've heard that, that, that you basically would be, uh, you would support the inclusion of EBOs uh, within the uh, existing civil court orders. Can I take your comments on that, uh, Mrs. Morsley? Um, if there's perceived to be a gap, then emergency barring orders in some shape or form, my, I would come back to stressing that whatever sanction, whether it's civil or criminal, would obviously be a matter for the committee to think about. I'm, my slight concern would be <laughs> on the complexity and the interaction with other and forthcoming changes in the legislative process, which you as a committee are fully aware. That's one. The other aspect that I would obviously address is draw your attention to Article 57 of the Convention, which relates to the provision, obviously, of legal representation and advice, which would be required in respect of both parties. So I think that would be my comments. Yeah, from a police perspective, um as I've intimated, we welcome the discussion. I have some slight concerns about the pace, given there is no recognised model which would naturally fit in with Scots law and that would be subject to some lengthy discussion. I think it would be very important to get this right in the first instance. So I have some concern about the pace at which this may need to progress to be involved or included in the domestic abuse bill. Thank you. Dr Scott? I'll just, um, I'll say that, that I, I am a fan of getting it right the first time, but I also know that um, Scottish Women's Aid and um, uh, our allies in the domestic abuse world have been calling for something along these measures for more than five years. And, and I am very concerned that our window of opportunity with this bill will close and that we'll be spending another five years debating exactly how to get this right. So I guess, um, I am aware and I, I agree with the detective superintendent that there, there is some um, really strong uh, evidence around there about how we might get it wrong and we must pay attention to that evidence. But I, I think this is an opportunity that women and children would, would urge you to take. Thank you. From an, from an academic perspective, I'm purely looking at it from the research evidence from other countries. And obviously there's no one model that we can transport to any other jurisdiction. But I think there is enough evidence from research in other European countries, including research from England and Wales as well, that they are effective, they can be effective. Um, and if you get the process around it right, that they're a useful supplement to existing criminal justice and civil justice response. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Okay. Uh, Mary? Uh, thank you very much, and uh, yeah, I just really want to pick up on, on Marcia Scott's point there because I do think, you know, I think everybody around this table recognises that I think, well, we have got an opportunity here and we want to take more evidence on this because we do think it's such a, a vital issue and something that we should be considering. And it was just really to touch on as well to uh, Professor Burton's point there because I understand you talk about, you know, there isn't one transferable model that we can just pick up and, and implement here. Um, but I did, I, I read your submission with great interest because I do think it's, it was really interesting to see how they can work in other countries. Um, but I mean, if, because I do think that if we decide to take this forward as a committee, we will have to look at what sort of model we would want to see uh, and where we go next. And even though one may not be automatically transferable, is there one that you think we should aspire to aim for in Scotland or any one model in particular? Or, uh, yeah, just be interested to get your thoughts on that. I don't think there is one model. I think you can pick elements from different models and, and learn lessons in that way. For example, about what the duration of the order should be, what the level of authority for making an order should be, what the time length of the order should be. So there's not one country, I think, that gets all elements of it mm -hmm. right, although often Austria is held up as a particularly good example. Um, the duration of their orders is two weeks and can be extended up to four weeks if the uh, victim is applying for a longer order under the civil law and interdict in Scotland, uh, for, for example. Um, and a key feature in, in Austria as well is that there's funding for referral to support services, which enables the victim to get the support they need to apply for the longer term 
protection. So we shouldn't see emergency barring orders as a complete solution. The victim may still need an additional help to navigate the civil justice system or the criminal uh, justice uh, system. And that the level of authorisation shouldn't be set too high, although while we do have to give some acknowledgement to perpetrators' rights and interests, um, the overriding feature with emergency barring orders is protection of the victims, including children who are victims of domestic violence, and the right to life and the right to be free from inhuman and degrading treatment are more important uh, or superior to the right to property. And anyway, it's only a temporary interference uh, with property rights that is taking place here. So I think, although there's no one model, we can look at the issues that are arising from the way that the orders operate in other countries and, and address those points if we're looking to, to take forward um, such a provision in Scotland. Absolutely, and I think one of the benefits of looking at it now, at least in Scotland, is that yeah, we have other model, models we can look at and kind of yeah, see what the best operating elements of those are and implement them here. Sorry, Dr Scott, didn't mean to... Yeah, no, I've, I've, I have a little list of critical features, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, many of which I've touched on already, but I guess I would just add... Um, we do like the Austrian model. We think it needs to be at least of two weeks, and, and part of that is just research that, w that um, we're aware of uh, in terms of how long it takes to, for a victim to uh, take up services and then for those services to respond appropriately in order for everybody in the system to have a better sense of what the next steps should look like. Um, it's, this has not been mentioned yet, and it's absolutely critical that there be no discrimination in, in eligibility for this order. So it shouldn't be based on immigration status. Um, we're very well aware that the, the um, victims without secure immigration status are here on a spousal visa or all of the possible um, uh, permutations of their migration status are even more in need of protection than, than other victims. So that is really critical from our perspective. Um, again, we think that needs to be a, a very clear commitment and systematic um, uh, referral to, to uh, support services, women's aid services, obviously, the one I'm, I'm thinking of. We know that um, if that happens within 24 hours, it increases the likelihood of take up of service enormously. And I had personal um, experience of this in West Lothian when we put in an, an opt out rather than an opt in um, arrangement with police. Up, our take up of services went from 40 something percent to 90 percent. So, you know, and we have lots of evidence um, uh, in other places that that's a really critical element. Uh, I think we want to make sure that it's free for the victim and our obvious lessons from England and Wales are and free for the police. I mean, we, ca we can't put in a disincentive to our closest partners in making helping women and children find safety by, uh, by taking it out of their budgets. Um, and we think the breach needs to be criminal. Mm -hmm. In Austria, the breach isn't criminal, so that's perhaps right, the only okay, weakness yeah. of the Austrian model, but um, it's a 500 euro fine for breach. So um, in England and Wales, the breach of um, a domestic violence prevention order isn't a criminal offence either, although uh, the evaluation of uh, the orders suggested perhaps that consideration should be given to criminalising the breach. There are potential disadvantages of criminalising breaches of civil orders, but um, consideration <coughs> needs to give, be given to the potential strength of criminalising breaches in that it, it would make stronger enforcement. Yeah, just to follow on from that, I mean, how do the penalties vary across the different countries in terms mm. of yeah, some of the, the lower penalties compared to some of the other sanctions that can be put in place? Yes, I mean, in some countries, for example, Austria, it's a fine. In England and Wales, a fine or contempt of court, uh, which can lead to up to two years imprisonment but in some countries it's a criminal offence which you know can lead to immediate imprisonment and just my, one final point i wanted to touch on as well was one that ds mcdidi you uh, raised in a previous answer to a question and that was about and also professor burton it was in your evidence as well about ebos and their effectiveness at reducing repeat victimization because i'm right in saying is it's only the home office that you've been able to get some of the figures on that from yeah, and to hear some more about that. Yes, unfortunately, there is a very limited evidence base here. None of the countries in Europe have evaluated the effect of emergency barring orders on long-term um, recidivism. 
um, the pilot study in England and Wales was the only one to look at um, recidivism and the impact of emergency barring orders. And obviously there were methodological difficulties in trying to find out whether emergency barring orders reduce repeat victimisation. The measure that they used was repeat call-outs to the police after an emergency barring order was made, comparing it to situations where there were no emergency barring orders. And what they found in the 19-month follow-up period was that in situations where an emergency barring order was made, there was a reduced number of repeat calls to the police for domestic in, uh, violence, particularly where leading up to the barring order being made, there were three or more calls to the police. So what they called chronic cases where the police were called three or more times prior to the making of the emergency barring order. The making of the order seemed then to have the most effect in terms of re reducing repeat calls to the police. I guess we have to be careful when we're using repeat calls to the police as a measure of recidivism because it may mm -hmm. actually be that the victims have been put off calling the police again because they were not happy with the response uh, that, that's being made. Um, in England and Wales, they did talk to some victims about how they felt about the emergency barring orders and they were mainly supportive of the emergency barring orders and that led to the, the researchers to conclude that victims weren't being put off calling the police again because they were unhappy that a barring order had been made. But the evidence base is not great, I must say, but what evidence there is suggests that maybe emergency barring orders may have some effect, at least in a, a short period after up to 18 months um, repeat, on repeat violence. Okay. Can I just add that I, th I think it's important also to think um, beyond uh, recidivism and think about prevention of homelessness. Mm -hmm. And as um, I think uh, many of you are aware, we did a piece of uh, work with a team of community researchers in Fife and the, the, re the ensuing report, which is called Change, Justice, Fairness, pointed out that the, currently um, in Scotland what happens very often is that in order for women to be assured that they are safe and for the system to um, respond to their needs, they have to declare themselves homeless. And, and uh, one of the reasons for that is this gap in, um, and, and the failure of having a mechanism that allows systems to coalesce um, around a, a family in their own home. And so hence the, the and 40% of the, of the women in the survey that was done in the research in Fife had been made homeless more than once. So there are, there are other costs in the system that will reduce as a, as a, as a result of this, we're convinced. And um, the overwhelming amount of harm that is reduced in avoiding homelessness and, and um, of women and children in the context of domestic abuse makes it a huge argument and delivers a, f a fabulous payback in other parts of the system. Not to the police necessarily, but. Thank you very much, thank you. Lee MacArthur. Burton, when I asked you, you talked about extending the duration of the of the, the barring order to sort of four to seven days. Uh, Dr. Scott, you then talked about two weeks as the as the optimum. I mean, I'm struck that there's a balance almost between um, the longer the duration, perhaps the higher the threshold. Um, is there a risk if we were to go to to two weeks, for example, that that the disruption that that would cause may put off um, the application of, of barring orders and that? Therefore, much as we would like to give as, as much time as possible, um, that, that, that maybe closer to the four or seven days, we would ensure that, that um, it's applied as, as, as rigorously as we, we would want it to, to apply. I mean, I think that the, the problem that actually you've identified, which is very real, is the, the capacity of the system to understand domestic abuse. Um, so, if there is reluctance to, to um, uh, use an, an EBO um, because of an in, you know a threshold of risk, um, I, I think that the that's a training um, indicator rather than a reason not to have um, a, a longer time available in order for the services and the the victims to um, become confident that they can be safe. 
I, I think um, th that you might well in, fi in fact find some evidence that there is reluctance on the part of the system. Um, uh, but I think those are about a long history of privileging rights of property over the human rights uh, um, of safety. Was there a reason you opted for four to seven days as opposed to two weeks? Uh, I, I didn't opt for four to seven days. Right. That was the recommendation of the researchers that carried out um, the Home Office funded evaluation that consideration right. be given to extending um, the orders, the, the domestic violence prevention notice to four to seven days because what they found was that fewer orders were being applied for than anticipated. Um, and so they asked the police why and they said the bureaucratic burden uh, was putting them off. They didn't have sufficient time to get together a case to go for a longer domestic violence prevention order. So that, that came out of um, that particular Home Office report, a recommendation of four to seven days. I think in, in my evidence to the committee, I, I said um, the duration of the order consideration to be given to making it at least one week. Yeah. Um, and that seems to be, you know, um, to me, a reasonable length of time. Uh, to, to interfere with the perpetrator's uh, rights before uh, the matter is considered by a judicial uh, authority. Right. Is that a view that you would share, DSP? Just to clarify, I think what we're talking about here, the uh, domestic violence protection notice issued by police, by a superintendent or above, is for 48 hours. And I think, if I've interpreted it correctly, the suggestion is that extension by police without judicial review could be extended up to four to seven days, and thereafter it would still be subject to um, court, uh, court order up to um, the order of 28 days, is my understanding. So it's still effectively four weeks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Okay, thank you. Rona? Thank you, convener. Um, yes, I wonder if the panel have a view on what tests should be met before an EBO is um, imposed. I mean, does this bring us back to the original question of risk assessment? And um, is there a danger of the threshold being set too high or, or too low? Anybody? So I come back to a policing perspective about the risk assessment, which we, we started this evidence session, the domestic abuse questions. That um, is the order in which appears to be applied in England and Wales, albeit they have a different terminology for the risk assessment. It is, in essence, the same model. They, they appear to apply, and I'll defer to uh, academia, but they appear to apply um, any heightened risk um, as being one of the necessities or the tests of requirement. And I would suggest that that, if the committee is uh, agreeable, is a fair and uh, transparent process. There does have to be professional judgment because we know as a service and part of our training is that the recognition that victims by the nature of what they are reporting can minimise behaviours, so they would score very lowly on the risk assessment. But in effect, that um, gut instinct of an officer or, or another partner is suggesting that there is a heightened risk. We can escalate it, even though it may not meet the threshold. Can, can you give an example of what a heightened risk would be? So, um, 14... So, the scoring, each, each question carries a score. Um, as the total up, 14 or above, would start to indicate heightened risk, for which we would refer to a uh, multi-agency risk um, assessment. But also, if somebody scores three because perhaps they're not engaging with us, do you know they're not telling us the truth, but we can see other forms of evidence or we have other accounts from neighbours to say that this is occurring every week and actually they've seen the person with uh, injuries, we can apply professional judgment, okay. which overrides the score and, and, and that also is done by partners. Would previous offending come into that? This is a risk assessment around the victim, so uh -huh. the victim's perception, but yes, the police will take into account the whole circumstances of the report they're dealing. Okay, thank you. Yes. I think it's important that the threshold for making the order isn't set too high. If one of the reasons for having an emergency barring order is to plug gaps left by the criminal law, 
then it would be counterproductive to make the threshold for making the emergency borrowing order too high. So in England and Wales, um, it is not necessary for there to be actual violence used in order for the order to be made. So the officer has to have a reasonable belief that violence has been used or threatened and that an order is necessary in order to protect the victim from a threat of further violence or actual violence. Um, in other European countries, they do vary enormously in terms of the level of... Um, violence that has to be used or threatened in order for the order to be made. In some countries there has to be actual violence used before an order can be made, but in many countries um, psychological or emotional abuse is sufficient, a threat of violence is sufficient for the making of the order, and I think that that's where the evidence is that it's more effective in plugging gaps in the existing criminal law. And w would children being present, would that raise the height and the risk if children were present? I think, you know, whenever children are present, they are the indirect victims, if not the direct yeah. victims of domestic abuse. So that should, you know, come into the assessment. If violence is being threatened um, towards the, the adult a victim of domestic abuse, it's quite likely if the children witness that, that they're yeah. also being harmed. OK, thank you. Mary? Thank you, um, convener. I wanted to um, have a look at who should be covered by an EBO and how widespread that, that EBO um, should be. And we've already covered quite a number of the areas that I wanted to question. So I wanted to pose a scenario to the panel and I'd be keen to hear the panel's views. If you have um, a woman who's a victim of domestic abuse and she's deemed to be at significant risk and she has children who are at significant risk um, and an EBO um, is issued, and there is a, a set pattern of behaviour that that woman and those children have over, say, the course of a week, when an emergency barding or an emergency barding order, in theory, could could operate. Should the um, the schools that the children attend, the clubs that the children attend, the family visits that the woman does, all of which would be known to the perpetrator, should all of that be included? in the emergency barring order, because you could argue if they don't or they are not included in the emergency bar order, you are further victimising the victim of a crime. I mean, I think we've made our position clear that we think mm. that any of the customary spaces that the mm. women or children are, are likely to be um, involved in um, should be covered and that it's not about the place. Mm -hmm. It's about um, the, the protection around them in their daily lives. And so I think that, you know, I understand that there are complexities of, mm -hmm. of um, enforcing that, but I, I do think at the end of the day, we need to keep our eyes on the prize of safety rather than it's not associated with the property, it's associated with the, the, the autonomy and personal safety of the family. Professor I mean, historically, we used to have this debate around um, bail conditions, and the phrase was coined, uh, where she works, rests and plays, and I think the same is applicable to emergency barring orders. It's where the primary victim and the children mm. work, rest and play that needs to be covered. Mm. That's helpful. Thank you. D.S. McCready. Yeah, I think every case would be considered on its own merits, and the applicant, uh, if the committee feels necessary to legislate, uh, would have to, in my opinion, uh, offer justification for which this would be under consideration. I think it would be scrutinised by the authorising authority, whether it be initially as a, a senior police officer or a judicial review, um, the justification for inclusion or exclusion would be considered at that stage. But it should definitely be involved in guidance. Okay. I'm just a bit concerned at the use of the word justification. It's almost implying that the victim has to make some kind of case for going about her or her children's daily lives, almost. No, I find, in my uh, opinion, the justification comes from the police applying to prohibit somebody's movements or, or um, exclude them from certain areas. In some cases, it may not be in the benefit of the children. It would depend entirely on the, the circumstances come back to the point which I made at the outset, this is about victim safety and that is our focus equally alongside our partners, but I think it would be uh, considered on a case-by-case -case basis would be our position as opposed to an assumption that in every instance all orders are inclusive uh, to exclude a, a person from school or other premises. Sorry to be so 
pedantic, but when you say not in the interests of the children, are, are you saying that the police could, in theory, make a decision that it would be in the best interest of a child not to go somewhere? Or did I mis misunderstand what no, I, I, to explain? I, I guess what I'm trying to say is we wouldn't want to take a carte blanche approach to this. We would not want to say in every instance, in every EBO, these will be the factors that we will uh, exclude or include in the EBO. We, I think everyone should be considered on its merits. Okay, thank you. Ms Maudley? Maudley? Yes, yeah, so you, um, you referred to a particular scenario and I would just go back to what I said earlier mm. that the kind of risk that you're talking about would normally be covered by the not to contact an approach. So I would mm -hmm. support what um, Dr. Scott said about it being about the kind of person rather mm -hmm. than the place, because that obviously covers school, yeah. granny or wherever it may be. So that would maybe address your point, the contact. Mm -hmm. And I see that's the echo of the words in the Istanbul Convention of Article 52, which mm -hmm. it talks about, or contacting the victim or person at risk. So if you include children in that category, I, I think that would cover, that would cover your it. situation. It's almost that kind of belt and braces yeah. approach. I mean, the only thing, the only other points that I would pick up, and I completely endorse what was said earlier about if you're minded to do an emergency barring order then there would be a need to look at various aspects and I come back to the only point that really I'd be making that if this was say the police to impose uh, I would stress again that look at the nature of if you like the offending conduct against the, mm. the provisions of exclusion from the house and that's why I come back to echo the comments I made about judicial independent review at the soonest opportunity being proportionate in the sense of a quality of um, a quality a quality of arms and also all the implications for both mm. sides to be heard. So I would want, to, if you were minded, to be clear about what the appeal and the process was to have mm. that review mechanism, which I think is the safety and fairness that you would expect inherent in the Scottish system. Um, mm. And that's all I would say with regard to any period that perhaps this would apply for. Okay. Um, that's helpful. And just finally, very briefly, um, Ms Mosley, in an earlier answer to a question, you said that electronic communication should be included as a, a form of contact. And, and I, I would just be interested whether the rest of the panel members would, would agree with that. Yes, so the joint protocol with Crown Office, Procurator Fiscal Service and Police Scotland clearly indicates domestic abuse can occur uh, anywhere, including online. Mm -hmm. So we'd be supportive. I agree. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, convener. The issue of um, support services has already been covered to, to an extent, but I wonder are there any um, drawbacks from integrating the support services into the system of EBOs? And if there aren't any drawbacks and there are benefits, um, should there be automatic referrals um, for victims? I, I know you did quite a lot on this, Professor Barton. Yes. I think the drawback is that the, the services have sufficient funding to meet the need because if you make um, referral by the police mandatory on the making of an emergency barring order, that's likely to increase the demand for support services. So they'll be trying to meet that out of their existing budgets. In other um, jurisdictions, the legislation includes provision for funded intervention centres. So, for example, in the Netherlands, the Czech Republic, in Austria, they all have funded intervention centres um, to make automatic referral work. <laughs> so yeah. there is that issue. The only potential drawback is that there won't be enough money there for the support service to respond effectively to the demand that's created. But in Germany, where... Um, the model is that um, referral to support services is discretionary rather than mandatory. Uh, what they found was that even though it was discretionary, if the police made the referral, the victim was more likely to uptake the services. So there is you know, pretty reliable evidence that the most effective way to implement barring orders is if there's referral to support services and it's a multi-agency response. Right. And are there any differing views? Everyone can agreement with that? Well, there are no further questions, so can I thank the witnesses very much for uh, this very useful and helpful uh, evidence session. And with that, we move straight now to our next item, which is uh, agenda item number four, Justice Subcommittee on Policing and Feedback from the committee, subcommittee meeting 
of 26 of October 2017. I refer members to paper 9, which is note by the clerk, and invite Mary Fee to provide feedback. Thank you, um, Convener. The Justice Subcommittee on Policing met on the 26th of October 2017 when it held a roundtable evidence session on Police Scotland's engagement with black and minority ethnic BME communities. This was the subcommittee's first consideration of this issue and was very informative. We heard about many of the challenges facing the BME communities and the police service. And I won't cover them all today as we don't have time, but in summary, more work needs to be done on building trust, on the police service finding ways to engage with all parts of the BME communities to increase an understanding and awareness of the issues they face and not just their representatives, on providing ongoing diversity training for police officers, in particular new recruits, so that they can interact positively with BME communities, and finally on the negative impact on relationships due to the role of Police Scotland in Home Office Dawn Raids, on houses and business premises to apprehend people suspected of being in Scotland illegally. The subcommittee heard of the challenges that all public bodies face to employ and retain a diverse workforce, and we were therefore pleased to hear about the work of Police Scotland's positive action team to increase the number of minority ethnic entrants to the police workforce, and look forward to seeing the evaluation of this initiative in due course. And the subcommittee is exploring how to take forward the suggestion from the Scottish Refugee Council that there should be a review of how Police Scotland and the Crown Office are working with the migrant community in Scotland. And the next meeting of the subcommittee is scheduled for Thursday the 9th of November, when it will take evidence on the police service's budget planning for the next financial year. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Do, Mary, uh, do members have any questions or comments for Mary? Uh, no, Liam? I had another point I wanted to raise before we go into private session, if that's possible. Yes, certainly. It was just from the meeting of the Scottish Youth Parliament uh, last Friday and Saturday. Uh, Morris, Corey and myself met with the members of the Justice Committee of the Scottish Youth Parliament, which is a, a very useful session. Um, there was a lot of discussion about the issues that they are prioritising uh, alongside the, work, the issues we've been working on, the legislation we've been scrutinising. And a number of ideas emerged from that. Um, uh, there was a, an encouragement for MSYPs to contact the, their MSPs and develop the relationship that way. Uh, the convener is a constituent of, of RONAs, and, and obviously there's a, a, a link there. Um, but we were suggesting possibly periodic meetings between the convener and vice convener of that committee and this committee might be something we look at, certainly in terms of sharing our work programme with them, so they're cited on what we're looking to do over the next four to six months. Uh, and in terms of requests for, for evidence, um, I, I, again, I made the offer, uh, hopefully not prematurely, that we would uh, ensure that they were cited on the request for evidence that we were putting out. Now, there may be other ideas that, that colleagues have, but as a, as a bare minimum for, for trying to enhance the way in which we work alongside the Scottish Youth Parliament. Latitude in that, but really it should mm. be something that we discuss under our work programme. And okay. as members all know, this committee, more than most, is under huge pressure um, for scrutinising bills. Three currently on the go, a fourth on the way. There are real concerns about our ability to do that. However, um, it sounds a very interesting suggestion, one that we'll explore far further when we now move into private session. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday, 7th of November 2017, when our main business will be further consideration of the offensive behaviour at football. And I suspend now to allow the public gallery to clear, if we have a public gallery. <laughs>